Today's scripture reading comes to us from the 23rd chapter of Luke's Gospel. It is Jesus' first word to us from Golgotha. Listen for a word from God. When they came to the place that is called the Skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing and they cast lots to divide his clothing. And the people stood by watching, but the leaders scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is the Messiah of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. Well, you can probably tell that I'm coming to you today from a different place than before. I'm not behind my desk in the Vigay. You could probably also hear the church bells in the tower behind me. I woke up this morning and decided that it would be a good idea to take a bit of a mini pilgrimage up to the top of a distant mountain where this uh, tower behind me actually rests. On my way up here, I walked past an old Benedictine abbey and I found a description there on one of its great walls. It was written in German, and I did my best to translate it into English. This is what it said. After the Benedictine women were expelled by the Nazi regime, this house or building served as a collective warehouse for 474 Jewish citizens of Bonn and the surrounding area in 1941 and 1942. From here, they went to the concentration camp. Only seven survived. Despite the beauty of this place, the air is still heavy up here. It reminds me of the holy hill to which Jesus had to journey as well. But before I get there, it makes me think of what uh, the average Bonner must have felt like. Uh, back in those days, in the difficult times of national trial and of oppression of many of its citizens. I wonder what the Benedictine nuns would have felt as they were sitting in their spaces, as they heard maybe one night the trucks winding their way up the pilgrim's path that leads its way to this space the men shouting on the outside, forcing them to leave the place that they called home, this holy hill that was their home. What the Jews who were brought to that warehouse were made to feel like, the voices they heard shouting, calling them names, whatever it might have been. Like I said, it reminds me of kind of the situation we read about today. If you think about the scripture passage that I just read to you. Jesus isn't the only one who has stuff to say. In fact, what he does have to say gets a little bit drowned out by what everybody else has to say. People dividing up his clothes, arguing over what they're going to get. People mocking him, making fun of him for what he called himself or what they called him, the king of the Jews. Yeah, Jesus' voice gets drowned out amidst the cacophony of voices that are heard. But the ironic thing is that through all of that, the only voice that really mattered was the one that was drowned out. The only voice that really mattered was the silenced voice. Jesus' words, the only words I guess he could muster as he's being dragged to a cross against, in one way against his will, was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Jesus, one of Jesus' last words on the way to the cross was a plea for our forgiveness, not for his, but for ours. It was a plea that God would hear our prayers in a very real way. 
You know, the interesting thing about forgiveness for Christians is that forgiveness isn't some simple uh, patting somebody on the back and saying, you're all good, man, no worries. For Christians, forgiveness is everything. In forgiveness is embodied reconciliation, salvation, redemption, hope. Without forgiveness, there's nothing. So when Jesus prays for forgiveness, he prays that we might have hope for tomorrow that his death is not the end, but the beginning of something new, of something wonderful. I have a feeling that even if you're alone in your room right now, you hear a lot of noise. You turn on Facebook and go to the news page and hear people talking about what they think about what the best cure for the virus is or whatever that might be. Maybe you have had a lot of time to look in the mirror and you wonder what you're saying about yourself. The noise about who you say and who you believe you are drowns out the calling on your life that says you are a child of God. Maybe you're afraid to hear more noise. Maybe you're afraid to pick up the phone. It might be your job saying that they have to lay you off. It might be a call from the nursing home saying she didn't make it. The noise is drowning out the word of reconciliation, redemption, and hope. The truth is we have to listen to people if we're gonna survive this. We have to listen to the experts, we have to be smart. But we can't let the noise, we can't let the concophony of voices drown out the more important words of hope, of redemption, of promise for tomorrow. We can't forget that Jesus' humble words the words that could hardly be heard amidst the cacophony of voices all around him were the words of salvation, were the words of redemption and hope. So whatever words you're hearing, remember this, the only word that really matters, the only word that has been spoken over your life both now and in eternity is a prayer of Jesus on your behalf. Father, forgive them, forgive him. Forgive her. Forgive whomever needs forgiveness. Those are the words, the only words that really matter. And they've been spoken by a God who is as all-loving as God is all-powerful. Take heart. Be at peace. Have courage and hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted and support the weak. Help the suffering and honor all people as you love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.